is the Electile Dysfunction Podcast with Ashton Cohen. Welcome back to the Electile Dysfunction Podcast with Ashton Cohen. I'm Ashton Cohen. I'm joined today by Dr. Carl Hart. Dr. Hart is a neuroscientist and professor at Columbia University. He is the author of Drug Use for Grownups, a fascinating book which uh, has caused uh, quite a stir. Uh, but contains a lot of interesting facts and arguments I've never really heard before, never encountered before, and I think a lot of people are going to feel the same way. Um, so, Dr. Hart, thank you uh, so much for being with me. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. Uh, so, you start off the book, it's very interesting, you start off the book making these really principled, I would say pro-freedom, pro-liberty arguments that appeals to somebody like me. Uh, you know, I, for lack of a better term, somebody who's a freedom maximalist, someone who cares very much about civil liberties and freedoms. Um, you're by no means a right winger, but you make a lot of these sort of points that people who are small government types, civil liberty oriented, would really agree with. And the the initial point of it, you you start off with the Jefferson quote: "If people let government decide which foods they eat and which medicines they take, their bodies will soon be." as sorry a state as the souls of those who live under tyranny. And then you get into the Declaration of Independence, how that guarantees life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Governments are designed to secure our inalienable rights so long as we don't you know, interfere with other people's rights. Uh, you talk about how, how easy it is for the government to manufacture crises that are designed to infringe upon our, our rights and civil liberties, whether it be the attacks on free speech, Things like the Patriot Act, uh, you know, throw in the some of the COVID lockdown policies in this as well. Um, so you're very, very much talking about language, I, and and that's interesting. I didn't actually think that it would be sort of premised on on these sorts of you know gr- grounded principles to start off. So give us a little bit more background on on who Carl Hart is uh, and what your central thesis is in terms of how we as a society, particularly American society, should treat drugs from a cultural and and legislative perspective so uh, just just fundamentally let's think about what the book is about and what i'm about so i've been studying drugs for about 30 years now and it's taken me that long to just come to the basic sort of this basic position and this basic position is very american it's not Republican, Libertarian, or Democratic. Um, People get confused all the time. This is the founding principles of our country. This is who we say we are. And so it's taken me a long time in my life and education to understand that um, the thing that makes us American are those guaranteed birthrights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's it. Very simple. So when you see the world through that lens, um, uh, anything that is inconsistent with that, and then you question. And the way we treat drugs in this country uh, is inconsistent with that basic promise of the country. So it makes it so simple. This isn't complicated. Americans complicate this thing because Americans live in these live with these contra- these contradictions to their basic sort of prom- promises. And so that's all I'm trying to do is say, wait. If somebody wants to alter their consciousness, who gives you the right to tell them how they can do it? Or Mm -hmm. who gives you the right to tell them they can't do it? Very simple. And then people bring in all of these things that are irrelevant and things that are more mythology than reality. And they say, well, these these drugs are so dangerous they will kill a person. They will do whatever. I mean, we give these drugs every day in a place like Columbia University and other universities. We give these drugs. We try to study these effects to help people to understand under which the conditions that they are more likely to uh, cause negative effects versus positive effects. All of this stuff is done in order to give us a better education to help uh, make our society safer if people so choose to use those drugs. Just like when we think about driving. Driving an automobile could be potentially dangerous, uh, but then we have a lot of knowledge to enhance the safety of that activity. Like we ask people to wear our seat belts, we tell people to uh, go a certain speed limit. All of those things are done to enhance the safety of that, that activity. And we have some restrictions on that activity in order to enhance the safety. But we don't ban that activity. We can think of the same thing. We can say the same thing about guns, all of these sort of things. But when it comes to drugs, 
we somehow lose our mind or we somehow are unable to logically walk through these things without the hysteria. And so the basic premise of the book is trying to get Americans to fucking live like Americans or to be consistent with their principles. That's it. It's very simple. It's taken me 30 years to like come to this simple position but I had to travel around the globe and I had to get all of these experiences to see how inconsistent we are. Um, we, we can get into what's going on now in uh, Ukraine and, and how that conflicts with our sort of uh, uh, thinking of ourselves as human, humanitarians. We can think about Syria, we can think about Palestine, we can think about all of these things and how it conflicts with who we say we are. Uh, but my area is drugs, and so I am. Uh, I've thought deeply about this, and that, that's what the book is about. Um, just trying to get people to uh, let people enjoy their freedoms, trying to get people to love other people, to think about other people, and to care about other people. That's it. When do you think people are capable? So let, here, let's say it here. So obviously, alcohol is twenty-one and up. Uh, marijuana has been legalized in places like California. It's twenty-one and up. What do you have you spent any time thinking about what the proper age would be for consents of some of these harder drugs that you think should be legalized? Yeah, so when we use terms like harder drugs, let's get rid of that. The pharmacology in the body doesn't see drugs like that. That's again, this is a human sort of um, uh, issue, not a body, not a not a physical issue. Uh, now, when I think about the age requirement, I think about. Um, Okay, we give people me. I spent four years in the Air Force. Um, I went into the Air Force at age 17. Uh, and so when I think about at what age should a person, can a person be able to engage in psychoactive subject, uh, drug use? 17, 18 is fine with me. I mean, you're old enough to carry an MC. M16, like me, I had an M16 at 17. Um, and then you're going to tell me I can't drink alcohol until I'm 21. That's the stupidest shit. But that's the kind of the, that's the kind of inconsistencies that we live with in this country and without even questioning in it. It's like any thinking person, if you're not thinking about that, something's well, yeah. you you might want to go and get your money back from your education because you're not thinking about these things that are important to the human condition. So I think most people, most logical people would agree with the alcohol bit of that for sure, right? That 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 part seems completely nonsensical that you, you can't have a beer at 18, but you can fight for your country. Now, people would obviously have a problem with your your stance on, say, something like heroin or meth or something like that. We'll, we'll get into that. And I want to hear what we have to say about those. So – Wait, wait, wait. We, we should talk there. We should start there because what people will have a, a problem with my stance. Yeah, please. So yeah, so you, you take issue with the, the term of harder drugs. And so people would say, okay, hard drugs are like heroin or meth. Why isn't that harder drugs? Well, I don't know what you mean by harder drugs, because when we think of like, well, I don't know, let's compare alcohol to heroin, for example. Um, if you uh, drink alcohol chronically for some extended period of time and then you abruptly discontinue and go through withdrawal, you run the risk of dying. Whereas you can do that with heroin and you don't have to really worry about dying unless you have some other health condition or something that might uh, cause that. But in general, you don't have to worry about dying with heroin from heroin withdrawal, but you do with alcohol. Uh, so what we call alcohol a hard drug, we don't typically call alcohol a hard drug. So the question is like, why do we call heroin a hard drug? Well, we call heroin a hard drug because of the sort of, because of our um, uh, past uh, vilification of the drug. And we vilified the drug in large part, not because of the drug itself, but because of the users, the people who were perceived to be the users of heroin, groups that we didn't particularly like in this country. And so that's one of, that's the, one of the main reasons we call it a hard drug. And so that's why I'm saying when we have this sort of hard, soft drug delineation or characterization, it's less than uh, pharmacologically accurate or important. You mentioned that there's no research supporting brain abnormalities as a result of taking, whether it be heroin, cocaine, meth. Can you can you discuss the, the researches on those? Yeah, uh, I, I don't I don't 
so let's think about methamphetamine. Methamphetamine is an FDA approved medication to treat uh, attention deficit disorder, to treat obesity. Methamphetamine and Adderall, the active chemical in Adderall, which is Z-amphetamine, they are essentially the same drug. But we have these wildly different narratives uh, when we think about Adderall compared to methamphetamine. And we do because of the illicit use of methamphetamine and the way it's been vilified in the country. Uh, but that's not based on like pharmacology. I mean, we have, I've, I've given well, hundreds, thousands of doses of methamphetamine in the lab and carefully studied the effects compared to things like the amphetamine. So have other people. Uh, mm -hmm. Our military uses amphetamines. These drugs um, have been around forever. Uh, um, before the 1970s, a number of people in our society uh, who we respect, John F. Kennedy, a number of people, our presidents, our our Congress people, a number of these people have taken amphetamines uh, for uh, increasing energy. Um, and so methamphetamine is essentially the same drugs, um, MDMA. Uh, is made by modifying the methamphetamine uh, structure. Uh, all of these things are, can be taken and have been taken safely without problems. It's true that our society, we see in our society, we see some people having problems with a drug like methamphetamine, illicit methamphetamine. But that's not the drug. That's the condition under which the drug's taken. That's related to the fact that the drugs are illegal and Americans get it twisted all the time. And, and that's the reason why I wrote the book, to try to help people to separate pharmacology uh, from um, uh, politics, sociology, and the rest of these things. But uh, please don't get it confused. Are there long-term side effects, whether it be... So, so you're saying there's there's no research supporting the abnormalities in the brain with heroin or meth or coke, as you said in the book. Are there other health effects that come with – let's stick with those three drugs, for example, because they, they get a lot of attention. Yeah. Um, of somebody who uses them, say, on a daily basis in – I don't know what – you obviously know more than me. What, what moderation would be considered? I'm not sure. Like what would be a moderate amount? I guess it depends on the person. But like do people incorporate this and take like a sort of a, a moderate amount, however that's defined, and be free from long-term health side effects? Yeah. So let's think about moderate, like you said. Um, think about your own alcohol use. Think about other people's alcohol use. Mm -hmm. uh, most of us don't use alcohol every day. You know, or we don't use large amounts every day just simply because our bodies can't take it. And we just uh, we have things to do when you might uh, have a hangover or slower to get slow to get up the next day. So you uh, use alcohol um, prudently. You would do the same thing with cocaine, with heroin, with MDMA, all of these things. So when we say, what's moderation? We already know what moderation is. We think about any activity, many activities that we do when we're on vacation. We don't do those activities every day simply because our bodies, we just can't take it. We're getting older and we takes us longer to recover from the whatever the effects are we have done on our vacation. So it's not that complicated. We made it complicated because we act as if people who do a drug like heroin, they do it every day. And that's the stupidest thing. Not let's, it's crazy. It's, it, we, we have that view because of our movies. It's so easy for someone who writes a movie, produces a mu movie to use to see, to have drama and sex by having the person be addicted to heroin, using every day, do, engaging in some. Right. That's the impression uh, I've had. Yeah. Engaging in some abhorrent behavior because it's, it, it facilitates the sort of story that the person's telling, but that's not reality. I mean, what responsible person engages in that kind of activity at, uh, to the exclusion of meeting um, their children's needs and whatever those things are? And we as a society have allowed people to tell that bullshit narrative, but it doesn't work that way. I mean, if you are, if you, if you've done any, if you've accomplished anything in your life, you know you have to uh, abstain from some activity in order to highly focus on completing this book, on completing this dissertation, on completing whatever you need to do. We all do it, and but and and and, and so when you finish, you might celebrate by. I don't know, going to see a show, or taking a drug, whatever you decide to do. It's just a normal sort of activity, but we have somehow allowed 
the narrative to be that if you take heroin, you got to do it every day. Nonsense. Is there any research indicating the um, brain effects on, let's say, minors? 15, 16, something like that with, with these drugs? Uh, well, as you know, you know, uh, it would be, as you know, uh, it would be hard to really do those kind of studies. But, you know, this conversation, the conversation you and I are having, my book is called Drug Use for Grownups, mainly adults, people. And one of the ways you shut down this conversation is that you bring in this notion of what about the children? You know, it's like the... Uh, Parents, for example, or adults engage in sex and we have sexual behavior we, in which we try to encourage, try to discourage children from engaging in at an age that's too early because they're not, they may not be a, a, a ready emotionally and those sort of things. But we don't shut the conversation down or we don't say, you know, we can't talk about sex be, or we can't have sex because of children. Uh, and so that's not my interest. Children, I, I have children. I've raised my children. My children are doing well. Um, and, and so when it came to drugs, the, the drug conversation was not special. It, I treated the conversation just like I treated that, the conversation with them driving a car, with them having relationships with significant others, uh, with them playing video games. It's all the same sort of thing. I have to parent. The same is true of other people. And, um, and, but what we, what we have done with something like drugs is that we have, uh, 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 I guess, abdicated our responsibility and want the government to take care of that, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things too, where because there's so much stigma around it that we've never had been able to have really open policy discussions about it because it's, it's kind of like a non-star to begin with. So I'm not exposed to any of the information that that you referenced in, in your book and I'm, I'm somebody who takes interest in you know public policy and things of that nature so I'm trying to you know educate myself on that as well um, with regards to something like addiction f- first off how would you define addiction and in terms of the things like heroin or coke or um, meth do they have addiction rates and if so do you know what they are yeah so well, again, these things are hard to compare, uh, like when you think about heroin, which is illegal, and then you think about tobacco and alcohol, which are legal. But the best available de- evidence we have is we think of something like cannabis, less than 10 percent of the people who take cannabis will meet criteria for addiction. I should explain or just uh, define what I mean when I say addiction. When I when I talk about addiction, I mean this thing we uh, uh, call it, we, we use the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, which is called the DSM. And the criteria for addiction is that uh, there are two components, uh, and, and you must meet both of these components. Component one is that you have uh, disrupt, disruption in your psychosocial functioning, meaning like you are failing to meet your obligations, whether they're school, work, home, um, and you are um, uh, taking the substance in larger amounts than you intended to, uh, taking you longer to recover from the drug effects or something of that nature. You have these disruptions in your psychosocial functioning. And the second component is that you are distressed by these disruptions. And so that's what I mean when I say addiction. Mm-hmm. And that's what we mean in medicine when we say addiction. Not that you use the substance every day and you're meeting all of your obligations and you're not distressed. That's not addiction. Um, because we can think of people who take antidepressants every day and mm-hmm. they're not uh, distressed, even though if they discontinue their um, antidepressant medications abruptly, they might experience withdrawal effects. Uh, but we wouldn't call that addiction. And so addiction is the disruptions of psychosocial functioning and the person is distressed. That's what I mean. So uh, when we look at addiction rates, something like cannabis, about less than 10 percent, something like alcohol, 15 percent, as much as 20 percent of the people who use will become addicted, uh, cocaine. Uh, 15, 20 percent of the people who use will become addicted. Uh, something like heroin, a quarter to a third might become addiction uh, addicted, and something like heroin. Uh, no. uh, I'm sorry, heroin is a quarter or a, or, or a third, and tobacco is a third of the people who use tobacco will become addicted. So those kind of things. I mean, those kind of those are the best sort of numbers we have. Uh, but the important point is that the vast majority of users of any drug 
never have problems related to addiction or never meet criteria for addiction. That's that's the important mm-hmm. part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I think maybe your messaging is, and I think it would be a reasonable one would be to say that, all right, look, know the risks going in if you know if you are from this sort of risk profile or something. So as you said, it's about a third. So you know, if you want to use it, use it. Um, but of course, there's this chance. Is that kind of like what your your messaging is? Yeah, it's a little more uh, refined or nuanced than that. In that, um, everybody does not have the same chance of becoming addicted. You know, so like uh, the people who have a greater chance of being addicted to something like heroin are, but at this moment, uh, white males who are unemployed or underemployed, um, and they. Um, uh, live in places like the Rust Belt in the country mm-hmm. where jobs have, have gone, um, where the economy has tanked, uh, where people were once someone and now they're no one. So all they that person has a greater chance of becoming addicted to something like heroin than somebody who uh, is gainfully employed, doing well in life, um, and has a family, all of that sort of thing. Those persons mm-hmm. are less likely to become addicted than that person who I described from the wet, from the Rust Belt. So that's important for people to understand. That tells us that addiction has mainly to do with these psychosocial sort of environments uh, in which drug use occurs, as opposed to like the drug itself. And it has more to do about the environment and the person. So Sort of uh, where they're where they're at. So yeah, if you're in a, if you're in a chaotic life situation uh, of distress, then obviously this is much more of a risk for you. If you're, you're right, so you need to be way more cautious before you even mess with any of this stuff. Um, what about what about um, physiologically? Is there a addiction component there? Do you mean like a brain or gene or something of that nature? Right. Or, just, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, we haven't identified any sort of genetic substrates that uh, uniquely predict addiction that hasn't been identified yet. Not to say that there uh, won't be something that's identified, but we haven't identified any of that yet. And so uh, really, uh, I would really strongly encourage people to uh, think about making sure that they are, uh, they have developed uh, skills that are important for them to achieve the goals that they have set for themselves in life. If they have developed those kind of skills, it's light le- it's l- it's a lot less likely that they will meet criteria for addiction. Um, um, it, it, this is uh, we can think about things like um, uh, I, I I don't know uh, any activity that people enjoy that they really enjoy doing. Many of them know how to temper their behavior. And then we have the issue as it relates to drugs that people worry about, well, what kind of impact I'm having on my brain, as you talked about, the, like the person who might well, take drugs every day. or uh, mm-hmm. uh, and, and that's probably not the smartest way to, to do this, to do anything, is engage in that activity every day, other than something like uh, maybe eating. Uh, even exercising every day uh, can be uh, traumatic uh, on your body, so you have to make sure you take breaks and that sort of thing. Um, but when we think about effects of drugs on the brain, there are a lot of activities that we condone in our society that are far more dangerous, in my view, than uh, taking many of the drugs that I'm talking about. Like, for example, we just had the Winter Olympics, uh, and I see like bobsledding, I see some of these sort of um, the skiing events, far more dangerous for one's brain than taking the drugs that I'm talking about in doses that uh, people seek for euphoria, um, like bobsledding, is sure, uh, that's a sure way to damage your brain. I mean, if you have been engaged in that activity for some extended period of time, there is going to be some problems with the brain. The same is true with American football. Uh, even soccer, uh, the way people head the ball. We don't even, we let kids play these games and we don't even act like it's a thing. Like, for example, my kids, I didn't even allow them to go on like roller coaster rides at like these amusement parks because I think those are far more dangerous to your brain uh, than uh, uh, the the doses that most people take these drugs. You say that the uh, opioid epidemic is overblown. Uh, you, the HHS the HHS has say a million people who have overdosed from opioids in the last twenty or so years. 
why do you say it's overblown? And is there anything about that narrative that you agree with that causes you concern? Yeah, I mean, just the way you phrase the number, like a million people in about 20 years, if we take something like tobacco in 20 years in the United States, then that would be 10 million people. Um, and, and so you, so you say like, but we never describe tobacco data like that, but in this case we say 20 years so we can really make the number large. But I, of course, I don't, I don't, I don't know where that number came from, but I can tell you the annual sort of numbers, what happens with the opioids. And, and when I say, I don't know if I say it's overblown, but what I say is that it's less than precise and less than accurate. That's what, that's what I mean. And, and so, and I'll tell you why I say that. Then uh, when we think about, um, uh, this is what concerns me and I try to write about this a lot, uh, people dying from what is described as drug uh, related overdose. So when people die and they have a drug in their system, it's counted as a drug overdose in many of these cases. Mm -hmm. And then we fail to consider a couple of, I mean, some important points like uh, most people who die have uh, uh, of these drug overdoses. They have multiple drugs in their system at the right. time. And we oftentimes don't measure the levels of any of the drugs to determine which drug, if any, were the causal agents. Uh, and, and so therefore, it, we don't inform the public of what uh, 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 inform the public such that we will know how to pre prevent this in the future uh, or we tell people how to avoid having the p potential problem drug combination. Um, uh, and secondly, uh, a number of people uh, who may die from drug related overdose deaths do so because they got tainted drug. That is, they thought they had one drug and then mm -hmm. they had a, a drug that was far more potent, meaning like fentanyl that, or something. You know, something like fentanyl, meaning mm -hmm. that smaller amounts are required to produce an effect and the person may have taken too much thinking that they had something else. I mean, so those are the, those simple uh, nuanced points are what, I, are what I try to communicate in the book in order to help us collect better data and in order to help us to be able to advise people in the future. Uh, because the problem, I mean, the, what I just described are easily fixed. And so if we really wanted to avoid uh, these things we call drug-related deaths, uh, they're, they're easy fixes. Yeah, so with, with regards to your point about the double counting of, of certain drugs, you know, someone had some, one drug in the system, they'll count as that being the cause. That's definitely a thing. That's something I'm a bit familiar with. With regards to the, the you know, the opioid crisis narrative. So, uh, and, and that's a good point, by the way. I mean, well, I got the numbers from the HHS, but they are usually cited in like 10-year gaps or 20-year gaps. They'll say something like a last year some maybe like a million for sure it has been going up with respect to these drugs alone or how they're counting them right and one of the main culprits is that's attributed or blamed for this is oxycotton which uh you know became one of the most successful drugs of all time particularly at launch and got special you know warning labels from the fda about how it's less addictive than other opioids etc and there's this this belief that Oxycontin came out a lot. Doctors handed them out. They thought that it was much safer than it was. Then people sort of became slaves to this thing, and then they they would they would be taking they would need more and more and more of it. And when they would stop taking it, or after the effects would sort of dissipate because they built up more of a tolerance, their pain would come back twice as much. Uh, so these these are the reports. What do you make of the whole oxycontin situation and those? remarks from people who, who said that because you say there's no effect on the brain that we can register but these people say that you know when they stopped using it or when the drug would wear off the pain will come back significantly more and that's what led them down the slippery slope and then they went on to try heroin right that's that's the story so what's what's your analysis on that whole situation it would oxycodone um, that that's the the chemical name for oxycontin uh, oxycodone when it was approved they uh, the pharmaceutical some uh, the pharmaceutical company purdue pharmaceutical uh, got a lower sort of uh, scheduling I mean, like opioid drugs like morphine that is used medically, uh, that are pain relievers, uh, they're scheduled too. 
which is the sort of most restricted uh, legally available prescription medication. Oxycodone got a scheduling that was Schedule 3 because uh, they convinced the FDA that it had less of an abuse potential than other opioids uh-huh. on the market. And right. of course, that turned out not to be true. And they paid a hefty fine for that. Pharmaceutical companies do this routinely. They right. want to get their drug uh, be less restricted in s- scheduling. That's what capitalism is all about. That's the, a capitalistic problem. That's what we're talking about there. And they paid a fine for that. That's what happened there. Now, this whole narrative that oxycodone or oxycodone is more dangerous and that, that's nonsense. I mean, it's an opioid. It is. It behaves like morphine and in, uh, in terms of pain relieving and as well as some of the psychoactive effects. That's just, it's just an opioid. It's not special in that re- re- regard. And this narrative that People say, oh, I got, a hook, I got hooked by my doctor and whatever. Um, uh, less than, um, uh, t- typically, uh, less than 1% of the people who are prescribed these medications for pain actually become addicted if their pain is being treated and they're being treated. Um, but there's this narrative that people uh, tuck oxycodone first and then they tuck heroin. I mean, that certainly might be true. I mean, I'm one person who've taken something like a Percocet before having taken heroin. Uh, I took Percocet uh, for a dental problem uh, 30, 40 years ago. And then maybe 30 years, 40 years later, I may have, I, I tried heroin, you know, but, and that, that says that I tried oxycodone first and then heroin 40 years later. But this, that's not a causal connection. And that's the kind of thing that people are doing. They're making these causal connections where they are not there. I mean, you don't just go from uh, getting a medication legally and being an upstanding citizen to going to the illicit market searching for heroin. I mean, like this is my area and I lived in the United States, I'm 55. I don't know the illicit heroin market and this is what I study. And and so it, it blows my mind that we've accepted this narrative uh, as if that's the main driver of this thing. What it has done is that it's restricted opioid pain pills so much that people who are genuinely experiencing pain can't get their medications because physicians are afraid to prescribe these medications for fear of the DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency, coming down on them for prescribing these medications to patients who've been maintained for a number of years. They've been successfully maintained on these medications. And so um, these narratives that we tell about opioids and causing people to go to the street and become addicted, there are people that have done that. But trust me, those people have had problems before um, uh, going to the street or even being prescribed these opioids. Uh, Opioids being prescribed by your physicians or any other drug is not going to lead the vast majority of patients to going to the black market. There is something else going on. And we, we have been reluctant to talk about what else is going on. And with respect to the um, the testimonies of people saying that their pain would come back significantly worse after these effects were off, is that what would you make of that? Is that a is that a unusual function, or is that something that's common? Yeah, that's unusual. Oh. That, that 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 means that the pain is not being treated. I mean, that's a that's an issue that they have to work out with their physician. To that could be idiosyncratic, and they have to figure it out. I mean. Uh, I think about uh, my sort of prescribing of of, uh, having prescribed opioids for dental pain, dental surgery and those sort of things. It's typically short term. And then once the surgery has after a few days, I'm good. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it worked and I wasn't in pain. That's a good thing. Uh, and, but then there are other people who have chronic pain that it requires a lot more skill on behalf of the mm-hmm. physician and a lot more work with the patient. And, and so if the patient's pain is not being relieved, that's on the physician. That's why they went to school to figure out these sort of things. And, and, and we're acting as if this, like they're, the people who are treating pain don't require any skills. It would be like me not doing my job. Do your job. With respect to to the um, the other issue that people have with even attempting to do a legalization or even decriminalization of of drugs, 
such as heroin or meth or uh, et cetera, uh, would be particularly in places like California, we have obviously we have this major homeless crisis, and um, Los Angeles Housing Authority. So the, the LA City government reports that about a third of people who are homeless have drug problems. San Francisco says fifty percent. There's their city government, and clearly, it's a, it's a massive problem in California, and it's there's clearly a mental health element to it. I mean, you, you know, you walk around and you see these people are really unwell, uh, and they're also doing drugs. And so, so the question is. Your stance is okay. So if you're if you're a autonomous, self-responsible human being, you're, you're handling your shit. You should be able to do whatever you want. Okay, fine. But what about these people who who are on the streets, who are dealing with these mental illnesses, and they're taking these drugs, which is probably you know exacerbating them, and that's causing a public health catastrophe that the rest of us have to deal with. You know, I mean, like my girlfriend can't walk. At night in many places in LA and many of my other female friends feel this the same way because these people are, are you know, who are mentally uh, unstable and you never know. So how do you how do you sort of rectify those two positions? Is it that if you are in a situation where you can take care of yourself, fine, use it. But if you're not, then maybe we have to talk about therapy with these people or, or, or commit them or whatever. What's your position on that? I think it's a silly argument and I hate to have to always address it. That's my, that's how I feel about it. And I'll tell you why more of those people who are homeless do alcohol than any other substance. Right. There's no conversation in the, com- in the country talking about banning alcohol. It's stupid. That's ridiculous. I mean, it's like uh, alcohol, it's a far bigger problem than any of these drugs. But yet when it comes to drugs, we act as if our, these drugs are causing the homeless issue it's not even connected but we act as if it does liberals conservative they all connect this and and they don't think about their sacred cow alcohol uh we think about um um, if we pretend that we care about the homeless and if we cared about the homeless how about we make sure they have housing and it's not about drugs is it i assure you that it's about these other issues, like uh, the, the same issues. Not gainfully employed, don't have the skills. Education, don't have the, they have a, maybe have some mental issues. Some may absolutely have some mental issues. Uh, the trauma that happens in a society, particularly as, we, as it relates to our recent pandemic and these sort of things. Um, so this is not a drug issue. But we attach whatever we don't understand or don't want to deal with, we attach it to drugs. And it's ridiculous. It's like saying that the homeless people, they all engage in urination. What are we going to do about urination? It's ridiculous. Is there not connection, though, between the causes that made somebody homeless, which could be issues with mental illness, and then when you are mentally ill, you take these drugs, it has even worse effect on you? Uh, just like anything. I mean, you know, if people are having problems, uh, I don't want them getting behind the wheel of a car. I don't want them having a gun. I don't want them having anything that they can potentially harm themselves or others. I mean, that's obvious. That's not, I don't know. The, The bottom line, man, is the book is, the subtitle is Chasing Liberty in the Land of Fear. I'm asking Americans, just live according to the original promise, allowing each of us life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as, a, as it relates to drugs, because drugs are my expertise. But when we start having these in exceptions, I'm a supporter of the Second Amendment. I mean, and guns kill people, and that's legally available. Drugs people take to have a good time. That's not available. That's a sick society. That's an indication of a sick society that does that. These instruments that can kill you are legally available. These instruments, I mean, that are designed to kill you. These instruments that people use for pleasure are banned. That's an indication of a sick society. My point was uh, with regards to... so. The, the homeless issue, because there has been studies about if you give them housing first and like I think 12% actually, uh, this was a Harvard medical study, like 12% actually stayed. I think the study was in San Francisco, but 
you know, there's obviously a huge mental health component to it, right? And so, and you're not even making, you're not, right. And you're not making the argument that mental health, people who are dealing with schizophrenia or whatever should be doing this stuff. You're making it for healthy adults, as you said. So that was, that's what I'm trying to get out there is trying to see how you delineate that. It's not, it's not connected. That's what I'm, I'm trying to tell you that this is just like the children's issue. What about the children? Uh, to shut down the conversation. Um, you know, if we're going to say, what about the homeless in a psychoactive substance? Well, we should be talking about alcohol and tobacco, not these other substances, because those substances are used far more widely among the, hubs, the homeless than uh, are the, these substances that I'm talking about. In, in your sort of ideal society, you would legalize essentially all drugs and what well, you would like give it licenses to certain people, like the, the way we treat alcohol or tobacco. How would you see that from a public policy perspective playing out? Yeah, I mean, we can we can do these things differently I, I, based on the pharmacology of the drug. I mean, uh, when when I would like to see these things legally regulated, it's important to mm -hmm. make sure people understand that legally regulated mm -hmm. means that there will be quality control. You don't have to worry about contaminants in your substances. You'll know the dose. You'll you'll know that it works by the sort of least invasive route of administration. You'll know. All of these sort of things that will enhance the safety of this activity. And in terms of the restrictions that we place on who can purchase them, of course, there'll be an age requirement. Of course, there might even be a competency requirement like there is with driving. You have to pass mm -hmm. a driving test. It all depends on the substance and it all depends on how we agree. But the, the major point is that I want Americans to understand that the way we are currently treating these things it's just inconsistent with who we say we are and how we figure that out. That's not that complicated. We put people on the moon and we can't figure out how to regulate these simple substances. I don't buy it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I would argue our American bureaucracy sometimes is, is more of a challenge in reforming that than putting people on the moon again. <laughs> but uh, uh, last question, is there any country that you look to that you think is doing doing it right well, the Americans, you know, we have such a great influence worldwide. Now, drug policy influences other people's drug policy, as we're seeing at the at the UN, as, as you have countries that uh, object or vote against the sort of resolutions. Um, when it comes to drugs, we do this at the UN. And so we influence everyone else's drug policy. Um, and so... Uh, there is no country that has like the ideal drug policy, but there are many countries that do not arrest their citizens for using drugs. Um, uh, like I live between New York and Switzerland because of that. I mean, in Switzerland, mm -hmm. I can actually live the American free dream. I, that's where freedom is at, really, uh, in terms of this substance. Uh, uh, but the, the Swiss, they, they also, uh, they ban the sale of these drugs uh, as well, but they're not arrested their citizens like we are in large numbers because of drug use and they also make available these things called drug checkings where where you can test uh, your your substance and get a chemical printout of what's contained in your substance so you if you have a contaminant something like fentanyl you'll know to take less of it or not to take it um, and, uh, so you're not taking drugs um, uh, in in the blind or in the dark and you're, you're not ignorant about your substance so um, some countries are, uh, are doing uh, many countries are doing better than us but um, no country has gotten it uh, completely right and real quick on that, so is that a place you go to that, that tests your drugs or is it like a, a personal like machine you can purchase there? No, you have to submit small samples of your drug to like a, a place and some like mm -hmm. 10 milligrams is enough, which is a really small amount. And, um, and you get this comp complete print, uh, chemical printout, uh, printout of hmm. the chemicals that are in it. I'm assuming that's, that's not legal in America. Uh, we don't have it in the United States, but we have the technology, of course. Okay. Interesting. Well, really appreciate the, the conversation. I think it was very interesting. The book is called Drug Use for Grownups. And um, Dr. Hart, is there anywhere where people can find you? Uh, I'm, uh, yeah, my website is drcarlhart.com. That's drcarlhart.com. Um, I have a Twitter account, but uh, it's so hard to like communicate in, in that space. Um, um, that's, I, 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 I try to stay off of it, but uh, you can always get at me uh, through my website. Appreciate it, man. Thanks so much for coming on. 
Thank you for having me. If you enjoyed our show, please click subscribe to stay up to date with our YouTube channel and podcast and give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts so that we can keep delivering guys some great content. Thanks for listening and we will be back next week. We're going to talk about the issues that really matter. Our country, our economy, the Fed, QE, GDP, BTC, NFTs, AOC, the CCP, Cardi B, Ow. Yeezy, Yellow Socks, Iran, Joe Biden's dementia, Come on, man. and probably sex robots. We stand for a free and open debate and exchange of ideas. And if you disagree with anything we talk about, you are a racist and no better than Hitler. What? Let's get started.